Good evening and welcome. My name is Victoria Pomery and I'm the Director of Turner Contemporary and it's great to see you all here tonight. Um, tonight's art debate is around public art and I think public art um, is one of those topics that causes an awful lot of people uh, huge problems. We've seen some massive successes over the recent time, most notably I think um, Anthony Gormley's Angel of the North, which sort of symbolises the North. I can remember in Liverpool working on a big commission with the Japanese artist Taro Chiezo called Super Lamb Banana. When we first installed it in Liverpool, people hated it, absolutely hated it. Um, two years on from that time, people loved it and were pe petitioning for it to stay in Liverpool, and it still exists. Um, so I think you can get a sense that public art creates lots of debate and I hope we're going to have some fantastic debates this evening. And obviously there's a longer history than the contemporary practice because we've always had public art but perhaps it wasn't um, quite as defined or as creative as it is today. It often involved um, placing men of significant stature on plinths. Um, Today's event, um, the Art Debate Public Art, has really been brought about thanks to Alex Chinook. And Alex has created a wonderful piece of um, art up in Cliftonville. And I hope most of you have had the chance to go and see that piece. Um, there's probably going to be a slide that comes up to show it, so I won't try and describe it. But I think what we really wanted to do was celebrate the fact that Margate has a tradition of public art making here. Um, years ago, Michael Craig Martin's piece, which we have uh, we've recreated in our lobby, um, was placed onto Margate Library. Since then, uh, we've commissioned Mike Nelson to make a piece called The Formula and a Code. Laura Ford was commissioned to make various bronze sculptures, which we placed in and around the town. And the... Um, Maltese artist Norbert Attard created a project on the Harbour Arm. So we do have a tradition of public art here in Margate, which should be celebrated. I'm going to hand over to um, Terry Perk, Dr Terry Perk, to lead this discussion and debate. We've got um, a very distinguished panel, and there will also be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions. And I think it's really important that it is a debate, so um, please feel free to ask whatever you'd like. There is a roving mic here, which um, I think Lauren's going to rush around with. And if you've got a burning question, do um, stick your hand up or make yourself known to Terry. Thank you, Victoria. OK, um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name's Terry Perk. I'm your chair for this evening. I'm also the course leader for the MA Fine Art Programme at the University for the Creative Arts and also the MA Curatorial Practice course, which was developed um, with our friends here at Turner Contemporary. Um, I'm not sure if we have to make any kind of health and safety announcements, but I suspect if there's a fire drill, it's not planned, and, and we just kind of calmly... We can, you can wave your hands around, but as long as we're doing it calmly as we kind of leave the building, I think we'll, we'll probably be OK. Um, so this is the second, I think it's the second, in um, Turner Contemporary's series of big debates. Um, last time we asked the question, what is art? And today we're looking to explore the idea of public art. What, what is it? Who's it for? And why do we feel the need to talk about it? Um, so in order to do this this evening, we're happy to welcome five panellists here with me um, that all have different relationships to the commissioning, development and production of public art and to thinking about art in the public realm, but also in the urban context. So on my left here, I have Daphne Wright, who's an artist, who's worked on a series of public art commissions across the United Kingdom and Ireland. Daphne has worked with a number of commissioning groups and has been the recipient of a Henry Moore Foundation Fellowship, Cheltenham Fellowship and the Paul Hamlin Award. To Daphne's left is Mark Davey, who's the founder of Future City, which is a cultural consultancy firm working in a range of urban contexts. Future City is the, you won't mind me saying, is the, um, is the largest public arts agency in the UK. And has worked on a range of large-scale development and commissioning projects, including Mark Wanninger's White Horse, and more recently Richard Wilson's 80-metre-long slipstream for Terminal 2A at Heathrow Airport, which I'm sure Mark will 
mention and uh, talk a little bit about this evening. Um, to my right is Tamsin Dillon, who's the Director of Art on the Underground. Um, art on the Underground commissions contemporary artists to respond to a range of contexts within the London Underground, working with and commissioning work from artists that have included Bob and Roberta Smith, Cindy Sherman, Mona Hartoum, Tracy Emin, and as I turned around a minute ago, about 20 other artists, dozens and dozens of artists <laughs> all the time. Um, so extremely, um, extremely experienced and knowledgeable in terms of commissioning artworks and the relation, thinking about the relationship between artwork, commissioner and place. Um, to Tamsin's right, we have Professor Gordana Fontana Curisti, who's an architect, architectural theoretician and urban designer. Gordana has published widely, most notably as the author of The Complete Works of Zaha Hadid for Thames and Hudson, and more recently, Foucault for Architects um, for Routledge Press. She's currently the director of CREATE, the Centre for Research in European Architecture at the University of Kent at Canterbury, where she also leads the PhD programme. And then to Gordana's right, and already briefly introduced by Victoria, is Alex uh, Chinek, who, as we said, is famous in these parts for his sliding house um, just up the road, um, from the knees of my nose to the belly of my toes. Um, and Alex's practice explores the material and symbolic language of our domestic and built environment. So hopefully you'd all like to um, join me in welcoming tonight's panel. We want to hear from the panel, but we also want to hear your perspective too. Um, there's no hierarchies here. Um, you've all, as I look around the room, I have a number of my MA students, I see people who are involved in commissioning um, art across the county and nationally, and you've all got stories to tell as well. So let's dissolve the hierarchies, all share our opinions, um, and see what um, happens as a result of um, the discussion and conversation. But I will kick things off um, this evening by um, asking each of the panel members um, to say to get to the nub of it, what we feel the purpose of public art is, and perhaps if they could give an example from their own experience of a piece of public art that they feel has met that purpose. So should we start, Alex, at your end? And I don't know whether you want to talk about your, your piece there, <laughs> so it's right in at the deep end, but over um, to you, what do you think the value of public art is? Okay, I, I prepared psychologically for a different question, I think, on the sheet, but that's okay. Um, well... I think, I guess a good way to lead into that is to talk about um, an artwork that most probably has had the greatest impact on my practice and my, uh, the kind of, I guess, the approach and the psychology that underpins what I think makes um, public art successful and exciting. And for me, that's um, Rachel Whiteley's house um, produced in East London, I think it was 96, which was the concrete cast the inversion of a house, essentially. And for me, as a, as a kind of public creative experience, um, I, I didn't realise it at the time, but that, that ticked many of the boxes that I think kind of work success, successfully in the public realm. And I think it's a real piece of, um, of impact, um, formally, visually, um, materially, and the story that comes with it in terms of the making and the process and the struggle. Um, but simultaneously, I think it's a piece which has a wonderful kind of... It, it has a wonderful harmony with its environment. And I think when making public art, that's a very important consideration. Um, it's not just about what you're making, it's, it's where you're making it. And it's, it's, it's a cast of a pre-existing structure. So the language of the work is intertwined with the pre-existing building, um, the shape, the period, the style, and the scale. And so it, 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 it's wonderfully, in my opinion, complementary to the context and the environment in which it stands. But simultaneously, it, it's different. Um, and so it's, it's, it strikes upon this kind of wonderful, uh, simultaneous ability to be subtle, but it's at the same time spectacular. And I think when making public sculpture, that's a combination that I strive to achieve. Um, a year and a half ago, I made a piece in Hackney called Telling the Truth Through False Teeth, where I took a dilapidated 50s factory and um, I removed every single pane of glass from its griddle windows and installed 312 identically smashed and cracked windows using 1,248 pieces of glass. And to me, um, that really 
kind of gets to the crux of, I guess, what I'm saying, this balance of spectacular and subtle. Uh, upon discovery, there's this wonderful kind of illusion and theatricality, but it can easily be missed. And it's about creating this wonderful harmony with the environment. And so, I mean, the, the, the difficult thing is that you, I, it's very difficult to put my feeling about public art in a nutshell because there's so many different kinds. But I think what I look for and what I'm excited by in terms of creation, just to initially focus on that, is, is, is I guess, those elements, I suppose. Thank you. Well, that's interesting what you're saying about this, this important value that you see between the actual work and the location it's in. Because, Dana, you come to it from the perspective of an architect and, and, and not, as an ar- not as an artist. And so dealing with the, the urban a much broader kind of urban planning rather than thinking about a single intervention. So I just wondered how you felt in, in that kind of broader context. Being an architect, I was involved always primarily in kind of considering the spaces within the city for a piece of public art rather than making an art object. So the concerns were always with the space. Uh, why? Because not every space in the city is appropriate for an art object. Okay. And even before I go into that, perhaps we could sort of define what is a public art, because that was one of your questions. And uh, although you have already started to unpack it, I think it's quite important to nevertheless underline that public art is that particular piece of art that we place in public space and as such does not receive the framework of the gallery or the museum, but it is really framed by the space of the public, usually uh, urban space, outdoors, could be indoors as well, but it is really kind of always working in relation to that public space. Therefore, that's quite important, the relationship. So the emphasis is not only on the object, but on the relationship. So we no longer have the space of the museum, we don't have the whiteness of gallery, we don't have this kind of framework like this kind of building where we are now. What we have are the streets of Margate, uh, the Cliftonville, or uh, streets of London, or Canterbury, or whatever, or landscape, because it could be also, uh, public art could also be in the landscape and so on and so forth, on the sea. So uh, that becomes quite important. So what I have been doing in my career is really sort of working with like-minded people, uh, usually architects and urban designers, considering which spaces would be uh, possible for uh, artists, like colleagues here, uh, to sort of act. So that's a kind of background to the conversation. Um, what I can highlight also as a possible issue is um, who makes decision in this kind of situation. And this is when, when, situation, when, when the whole thing gets a bit more complicated uh, because um, uh, public space is something that is uh, a political space as well. Uh, and therefore, who makes any kind of decision in, in the in the public space is really not only the architect or the artist, it's really everybody who, in a way, in a democracy, should be uh, everybody who is kind of somehow related to that space. People who live there, stakeholders, people who work there, anybody really could uh, be, as it were, a participatory um, factor in a decision about the public space. And perhaps that's where I want to kind of stop now. But I think that's something we'll return to later, these power relationships that are at play within the particular framework of citing or work existing in, 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 the, in, in that public realm outside the frameworks of the museum gallery. So we'll certainly pick up on that later. But Tamsin, to turn to you, in terms of going back to that idea of the value of public art, which is kind of a blunt mm. question. I mean, in your projects with Art on the Underground, are there certain instances where you feel that actually that's, that really has a value? In, is it a cultural value? Is it a value to the public? You, know. you mean um, 
particular project that a particular you project or, i mean or generally i mean what do you okay generally what do you think the value of public art is okay um well i want to start by trying to interrogate this term public art and think about why we make a distinction why we appear to be making a distinction between public art and art that apparently isn't public art does that mean anything that's not public art is private art um, or does it mean that art that's in a gallery is not public art? Those are the kind of questions that I um, immediately, as soon as I start thinking about um, a debate around public art that, that come into my head, and also thinking about what, what we mean by public as well, publicness, um, what, what does that mean? Um, what, do we mean we, what do we mean by the public realm? And... Who, and I think it's, it is important to think quite early on about um, who owns the spaces that we consider to be public spaces and um, why we have this tradition of, of placing art in those spaces and, and what that actually does mean. So in terms of my practice as a curator, um, and that's for, first and foremost what I would describe myself as um, rather than being someone who, who produces public art projects or commissions public art, because I'm interested in um, what happens when you bring artists who, who are great thinkers, who are responsive to um, environment, to material, to social conditions, what happens when you bring them um, into a space or an environment that isn't necessarily a gallery and, and invite them to make a response to that space. And they may well be artists whose work you're more likely to see in a gallery. Um, and at the same time, I'm interested in how they can have an opportunity to um, make a communication with um, an audience or a, um, a, a range of communities who wouldn't necessarily... Um, go and see their work in a gallery. So that's been my starting point um, for, for a while. And I think my own personal experience of, um, of encountering art outside of the gallery, um, I think, when, you know, when I was very young, I, I lived in Oxford, and there was this um, very strange intervention that was made by someone which was a shark that he um, put into the roof of a cinema in Oxford. And, and it, I think it was uh, it provoked a lot of controversy at the time. I think this was in the 70s. And, but also, you know, also became quite loved by um, local people. I'm not sure whether... I wouldn't want to say whether it was successful or good art or what it, it, what it was, but it had this impact that probably had an effect on my decision to become more involved in the arts and to train as an artist originally. Um, Rachel White Reed's House is, is another work that I would have cited as well as being um, a far more powerful uh, um, ex um, example of, um, of art outside of the gallery. Whether it, Again, whether I would make it a distinction and call it public art, I'm really... The, the jury's going to remain out for me on, on that, I think. But I think those, thinking about those terms, whether it's... I mean, because we talk about art in the public realm, it allows us to define a place. We talk about public art in that sense. We're, we're really not defining a place. We're defining the stakeholders involved with the constituent. I mean, there's public mm. artworks that are held in museum collections. Is mm. that public art... So whether that's a game of semantics or whether it's important to kind of explore all those different kind of notions, I think that's something we can, we can continue to unpack as we kind of go along. Right. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I can talk about public art and my experience with it, but initially I would say what I think public art should be in an idealised world, and I think... I agree that it's, it should be creating a democratic space and within that space um, it should be able to facilitate uh, 
debate, discussion, um, uh, public art that's attacked, public art that's graffitied. So I think it a, it's a, a, should be a very fought over space that we then, the facilitators, the curators, um, then facilitate that area or that um, political space. And I see it as a narrative space rather than anything that, that makes form. And I suppose in terms of um, where I see that working, there was a piece that um, was done by an artist in Bristol with field art projects and called Serena, and it's her, her spelling is K-O-R-D-A. And she looked at factory workers in the lost industries of Bristol. And then she reinterpreted the movement of those factory workers, and she made it into a folk dance. And there was something very ephemeral about it, where the movement of people around cities or repetitive movement, the disappearance of that movement or the disappearance of that physical repetition is then captured by an artist, but only fleetingly, and then it disappears. But the, the project did have a huge impact lo locally in a very... De deprived area that was being rebuilt. And I suppose in terms of um, ticking the boxes for a, social, uh, social, a socially aware project, that does it. But another project that I thought I, I don't like at all, but I thought was incredibly interesting, was the Wallace and Gromit project in, done in Bristol. And we had the usual thing of um, something like 200 Wallace and Gromit um, fiberglass figures that then were painted by everybody under the sun, but also lots of artists, lots of just ordinary people as well as celebrity people, and then they were placed all around Bristol, a bit like the cows that you find across Europe, and um, it, it was just remarkable. It it raised something like almost three million pounds for the children's hospital. It brought in. I don't know, some incredible amount of tourists. Um, there was buses that ran, particularly all around the city of Bristol, for a pound. Um, every child in every school contributed. Lots of the mums and dads within the schools were some of the artists who worked on the project. But in, in, and, and then the objects were then sold off to businesses. For some of them went for about £50,000. These are hideous kind of things. But I taught as a, you know, as a social raising of, you know, the the good feel factor of Bristol. Um, Wallace was pictured by the suspension bridge. It, it was just remarkable. It was like a souvenir of Bristol. But in terms of public art, I thought that was a, a really interesting narrative space. It was extremely democratic, but um, the the actual objects themselves. But who cares? It worked on loads of different levels. So that's it's interesting that, that that idea that certain kinds of public art might begin to define an identity for mm. a city, and whether Absolutely. that undermines um, any ownership of identity that the people who are residential in that area or local to that area or have some kind of narrative in relation to that that area have any stake in. You know, the idea that this work just kind of can sometimes just appear and, mm -hmm. and, and take a narrative or carry a narrative that doesn't belong there. And so, that, again, it returns to that question of power in those, in, in those, sorts, of context, in those sorts of contexts, um, the power of those narratives, who has ownership of those sorts of narratives that, yeah. that define the identity of a town. So I think yeah. that's, we, can, we can unpick that one mm -hmm. too. Mark? God, the worst of, when you're the last one, you get your brain <laughs> spinning with all the things you want to say. Um, what was the question? No, um, public art uh, is it, such a horrible, horrible word. I hate that word, I, and I hate the idea of public art, and I think it's part of our problem, and maybe it should be called uh, publicly funded art rather than public art, because that's where all the money comes from, isn't it? So all the money for art comes from the public sector, so it has to come out of the Arts Council or uh, agencies or, or the local authorities. And part of the problem for, for me, I think, has been that we've kind of been corralled into a world in which... You know, there's never enough money to do things properly, but we want to do things well. So I think we've tried very hard to, you know, a bizarre loan furrow, really, as, as an agency, trying to get businesses and other organisations to put money into the arts. Um, so I think arts 
should do amazing things, but I sometimes feel that we're just too isolated. And when you sort of, you know, you have an arch- architect, have a profession, they have a system, a structure. Landscape architects do all the kind of inhabitants of, of the urban world. Most of the trades and businesses have their own structure. And artists don't really have it, and neither do curators, neither do public arts people. So we're really kind of ragtag bag of people, you know. So I think um, art, when it's really successful, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's a catalyst for ideas, it provokes, it's left-field thinking. And in, and in an age of conformity, architecturally particularly, I think, you know, the architecture that we're, we're sort of saddled with now, um, you know, art is, can be amazing. And... So I, 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 I'm because I'm so sort of focused at the moment on the Slipstream project, which is the Richard Wilson sculpture at uh, Heathrow, I'm sort of really focused on Richard Wilson. And I think he's done a really clever thing of being publicly, really, uh, his, his works, work gets public acclaim, but it also gets critical acclaim. And that's quite a hard act to, to, you know, to follow, really. You know, that he, he balances the two. Um, and so things like recently, I went down to the Dallas Pavilion to see. I don't know if you saw the um, "Hang on, lads, I've got a great idea." You know, see, so you, you walk walk along the street and you look up, and or rather, everyone else is looking up, and you see this, uh, you know, moment from the Italian job where the coach is pivoted on the on the edge of the Delaware Pavilion. It's great. It's a great one listed building. It's rocking backwards and forwards. Or his oil piece at the Saatchi Gallery, where you go into the room and you see this incredible blackness and this reflection. Um, and you go down into the into this kind of uh, chamber and into the oil, or he's a slice of reality, the ship that's in theory is cut by the laser beam of the meridian line. So his work's always interesting. It's always, and of course, the best piece of all is Liverpool was uh, turning the place over, where he took a whole almost like a Tom and Jerry moment, where he cuts a circle out the facade of a building and pivots this this circle, and. Um, I just think he's a brilliant artist, and I think he does public art really well. And it's really interesting now, this, this piece at, uh, at, at Heathrow, this vast 76-tonne, huge piece that's going to slung off the beams and columns of the, of the, new, the new building, is his first major permanent work. So it'll be an interesting test to whether he can suddenly lock in uh, and make a work that's going to be seen by 20 million people a year. So I don't know where I've answered any of the questions you asked, but I, I've, I've, so I've, got, I've got quite strong opinions on, on public art. And I, I, love public, I love art in the public realm. I think art has a major role. We don't have enough uh, presence, and that, that's to our detriment. But, um, you know, we have a problem, I think. Thank you. Daphne, you, just to return to what, to what you said, um, the, the projects that you described... Um, or that you felt were really strong were those that, that engaged the public in the evolution of, of the work. How, how important do you think it is for the for the public to participate in the commissioning process or the development of a piece of um, work? Or do you feel that, that that could compromise the artist's integrity? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting one. And, and from my experience of maybe going being put forward as one of the of a group of guinea pig artists being being sent uh, forward to put forward our proposals um, i don't know i have very mixed feelings sometimes it's it, when you say public because sometimes i think um the councillors uh, the developer they're the public and um i don't i don't that i find very difficult because you're asking people who are not informed about art, this, this sounds terrible, n- not informed about art, to make it informed as if, you were, as if they were scientific, in, in the same role as a, as a scientist studying pure science and then you ask somebody to validate their thesis. So I, I think it's really problematic, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of enjoyment out of that and I think, and at the same time, I'm sceptical of projects that tick the boxes of um, interaction with the community. I, I, there's something wrong with that as well. So, yeah, I, I think the, the, in the working in the right way, there should be several different projects attached to each um, redevelopment, say. And some artists work on different levels. Some work in the community like that, but that there's enough space and gaps left for other kinds of artists. And I think that's when it's working well, but I think uh, so much of it, this depends on good curators. And 
curators that don't just use artists as this artist make that type of work, that one, that will facilitate that. I think that's very um, uh, regressive for, for public art. Well, should we ask, so, a, should probably, we ask a good curator? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, do you, do you ever find that, that's a, um, that, I mean, first of all, how do, how do you engage the public with, with your projects within art and the underground? And do, you ever, do artists ever feel that they're being compromised in some sense through that? I think the, the approach that we've tried to take um, is to be really honest and open about what it is we're inviting an artist to do. And um, just to say that the Art on the Underground programme is built on the legacy, an incredibly distinguished history and legacy, <coughs> legacy of world-class design and architecture and this incredibly well-known brand, which is so well-known because of the, the logo, the, um, the map by Harry Beck, and the artists that have been involved in making posters for the underground. Um, so it's had this incredible um, um, profile, this identity that's, been, that's built up over a century, and the Art on the Underground programme is therefore kind of standing on the shoulders of these giants um, but creating something new bringing um, that whole identity into a new uh, century a, a new um, a new approach that reflects contemporary art now it reflects the, the world now and it reflects London now and um, in that way we're asking artists I mean what I'm saying is we've, we've had the great... Um, I, I've had the great privilege of being able to have time to develop a programme. Over, so I've been there now for 11 years or so. And I think that's a key point to make around how artists might engage with a whole range of stakeholders or communities that might be... Um, you, that might live or work or have some kind of engagement with whatever context it is that you're that you're working in, um, to not be able to think that you can just fly in, parachute in, parachute out, but actually um, develop a program. I think we've we've developed the program in a kind of as if it's a res an ongoing research project, thinking about not just the incredible buildings that make up the the range of stations that. that that you have in London Underground and the tunnels and so these amazing spaces, but really the people that that work in the um, in the in the um, network and there are twenty thousand people that actually operate the whole network, so trying to communicate with them and four million people a day that use the network and there are six million people that use the bus network in London, more than that I think. So whenever we're when so what we've done is kind of develop a, a, a range of strands of programming to try and use a very limited resource in terms of funds and people. And we're, we are employed by London Underground, which I think is, a, a, is quite an important thing to say, because it means that we are, uh, we're integrated with colleagues who do all sorts of different jobs within London Underground. So it's enabled us to actually develop projects and, and kind of build advocacy with people who may not have had any interest in art or see the point of what we're doing at all. Um, but it enables us to um, really set out different kinds of opportunities for, for artists at stations or along across one particular line. But what we're, we're always clear about is that we... Um, we want them to respond to, the, to that context, and that means that it's going to involve thinking about how the audience is going to access that work. So, you know, the, it's not a kind of an added on, oh, how's, how are we going to add an engagement programme to this? It's uh, inviting the artist to think about how their, their audience is going to um, think about that in the first place. And so, um, you know, an intervention can can be a tiny little booklet like this, which didn't actually go out to um, the people that, that actually use the tube. It went to all the 
um, drivers and people that run the stations on the Piccadilly line. And this little booklet was designed um, by Jeremy Della. And, he, and um, it was for a project called What is the City But the People, which is a quote from a Shakespeare play. Um, and this book contains lots of lovely quotes by famous and not so famous people. Um, and we had the, he gave, Jeremy gave us the incredible task of trying to encourage all these people that run this line, the Piccadilly line, to use the, these quotes and, and build them into their communications with people <laughs> as they were driving their trains um, or, or giving out announcements in stations. So Jeremy forced us really to engage with with everybody that uses or is connected with the network and to, and to have to come up with our own strategies to think about how we would make them feel like, like doing that. <clears throat> So I, th I think that's, that's one example of a, of a the very interesting um, project. Yeah. Alex, just briefly, because I want to kind of move things on, in terms to, to kind of borrow from Tamsin's um, statement, Tamsin said, did you, with the, with the project at Cliftonville, I mean, how, how, how did you operate, or how did you feel you were operating with the public? Did you feel like you had parachuted in and you, and you, you kind of left, or did, you know, how... What's your relationship? What did you feel your relationship was in the development of um, the work at Cliftonville in terms of that relationship to the public? Do you feel that that was fruitful? Uh, yeah, ultimately, yeah. I mean, I think when you're going about designing a project um, and one that's on a, a street that people live on um, and care about, uh, it's, there's a very fine line, I think, between public engagement and um, NAF. And the way, you know, one way I navigate that, I, I try to navigate that is, and very fortunately, because it, it comes very naturally to me in terms of the, the, work, the work that I, I wish to make, is this kind of, is my work has a kind of conceptual accessibility. That's the way I look at it. And it delivers these very kind of simple pleasures of um, spectacle, human illusion. Um, and so immediately, I'm quite fortunate because I, I think people are at their most interesting when they're making the work that they're interested in. You know, and it, the work that comes very naturally. And so in that respect, I'm quite lucky because there is this element of accessibility. And I find that um, because of these ideas of kind of um, these engaging qualities of human illusion and th this kind of playful charm, uh, it immediately it, it seems to win over. Um, certainly in, it, in the eyes of the public, it's looked upon fondly, I find. Um, and so I always had that in my artillery, I think, when I was approaching this project. But... At the same time, um, we didn't. I, I was very, I was very sensitive and about. I was very conscious of this fact that this kind of young, trendy kid from Hackney with rolled up trousers is. <laughs> it's a friend of mine. <laughs> um, uh, it was turning up on this street. Which was obviously, and some of the residents had really embraced the arrival of Turner Contemporary, but some were simultaneously suspicious. And um, I think, in, in many ways, irrespective of whether the project was associated with Turner or not, I represented this kind of artist landing on their doorstep. And so we, it was, it was handled carefully, I think, and I, I worked very closely with um, Thanet District Council, and we, I did meet with Turner to kind of gauge their borrow their experience in, in, in this situation. And I worked very closely with Sophie Jeffrey from Margate Arts Creativity Heritage. And so that was the preparation, and that was understanding the strategy. And con contrary to what many people think, I'm on site every single day of the week, every hour of the day. And that was really important, and I learned a lot through that process because essentially I was the front of the project, and I was able to um, meet the residents um, explains to the residents what I was doing and why I was doing it. And that built very... I felt I built very positive relationships in that respect. And it eased this arrival of this very bold artwork. Um, and, I, and so that was one thing. But then there, that was the kind of preparation, the during. And then I feel like the after has been managed well. Uh, we did a letter drop to the surrounding streets... Uh, which was a kind of hand-drawn invitation, inviting them to come on a Sunday, uh, which was the same day that there was a farmer's market happening, very close by. So we put an advert in the local newspaper also. And we hired a cherry picker for the day, 
And so all of the children from the surrounding streets were able to see the artwork from a different perspective, but also see their district from an exciting perspective. And it was this kind of, it was this great kind of hybrid of kind of art opening um, and also kind of carnival and street party. So that's how we managed it. And so from a kind of administrational perspective, that was our approach. And from a creative perspective, I think I'm just quite fortunate in the fact that my work is quite friendly. So, yeah. Have we got anybody from Cliftonville here? <laughs> Would anybody like to share their views of that, of that piece of work? Well, you don't have to, but uh, as it, have you enjoyed having it on, your, on the street? Any art uh, that brings people particularly into the Cliftonville is very, very welcome. And uh, my wife uh, and I met uh, Alex before the uh, cherry picker uh, turned up, and uh, we con- her congratulated him on, uh, on his uh, work and idea. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. That's great to hear. Thank you. I thought it was interesting talking to people about their experiences of the work. I mean, I, I sort of enjoy it because it's feels sometimes like a forgotten area of town or there's a certain discourse around Cliftonville which is negative and it's nice to have nice things to talk about <laughs> about the area and it's good to see um, people smile in response to something that's happening on the street or to um, talk I talked to one of the children who was there on the cherry picker day she sort of said, yeah, there's art on my street. And I'm not sure she would have been able to tell you what art was, but she knew she enjoyed it at that moment. Um, and I also read lots of blogs about people who come to town. And so um, to, there's this sort of, you come to Margate, you feel like you've discovered Margate for the first time if you come from London for a day out and you write a blog about this amazing seaside place that you've discovered. And there's the old town and there's Turner Contemporary and there's the beach um, and maybe the Shell Grotto. And... Now that tends to include a stroll along Cliftonville Seafront and the Slidy House. And that's a really lovely thing to see happen in your area. So as a resident, I feel um, as a, a sort of side effect of the work that there's a spotlight, and that's a really nice thing, a spotlight in a nice way. Thank you. Um, I, just wanted, I just want to turn that around a little bit. And, and ask Mark and Gordana um, a question. Um, Gordana, when you were talking at the beginning, you, you spoke about finding places where um, art could exist in the, in the public realm, and that there are some places that work and some places that didn't. It kind of suggested that, and it's kind of been alluded to a little bit in, in some of the other comments, that there's a responsibility for, for art that exists in the public realm to not just take account of that context, but to be harmonious with that context. And one could argue that that's at odds with an idea that's very central to modern art practice, which is that art is, should be subversive, should be critical, should challenge that, um, the context that it's, that it's operating in. So do you, do you see that, there's a, do you see that as, a, as, a, as a problem? Or are you, would you feel that, it has, that, that, that harmony is more important? Right. Um, I think it's important to have a dialogue. Okay? And the dialogue uh, does not mean to have a harmonious agreement. So dialogue is important. And if I may say, I'm a fan of your project as well, and I'm proud to say that. And I also want to congratulate whoever was responsible. I think we had this brief discussion before the session, who actually have chosen, who has chosen this place, because I think it's a very good place that Cliftonville, as um, the person at the back has mentioned, uh, was chosen, because uh, we have been with Nick um, from Senate uh, District Council around Clintonville and aware of, of, of this situation. By we, I mean people from the School of Architecture, University of Kent, uh, and a lot of our students have worked for years in that area and so on and so forth. And it's really the area that was hungry for this kind of project and for care, for love, for somebody to come and talk to it. And uh, whether it was only you on, on, on your kind of initiative 
kind of finding it or whether you were guided by some other people, by the people from the council were involved or from Turner. Whoever was involved, I want to congratulate everybody because it was really a kind of a, a very successful kind of roadmap that led to that project. And, uh, and, and which, in a way, the, the person at the back and the people who are ultimately participants and, and, and people who live there uh, would agree. Now, whether that is a kind of too much agreement for you and whether we are sort of lacking here some kind of disharmony, I don't know. But I'm kind of happy to live with it. What I, what I like about this project, if I may say, is that it has a kind of degree of subversiveness. But that subversiveness is, in a way, matched by some kind of considerate care, if I could put it that way. Um, when I saw the image, just on the basis of the image, because I haven't visited it yet, and I want to see it desperately after the session, um, I, I had a feeling that you know this was the work of somebody who cared about the city, who cared about the people who worked there, and so on and so forth, because the gesture of the facade melting into the ground was sort of uh, doing this kind of two things, kind of bringing together the ground, that is to say the ground sort of standing for all people of Margate and Cliftonville and so on and so forth, somehow immersing them into the frontage, i.e. the facade of the building, the facade of Cliftonville, the facade of what Margate offers to the world. And these two things were coming together, you know. So people could feel represented though you could say that you are also taking something from them because you are protruding into the urban space by making that kind of curve. But that kind of intrusion that you are making into the urban space by that curve is sort of matched with the voice you have been given, you, you have given to the community through, as it were, the facade presented in this way. So I would say there is some kind of dialogue and I, I and this is why I think people react positively to it, because they don't feel excluded. They don't feel that your project is, as it were, an imposition upon their space, but they feel that they are included somehow in that project. Mm. And indeed, I, I, I have sort of concluded that even without you talking about all these things that you have done, just on the, on the basis of the gesture of, of, of the work of art that you exhibited, but even more so when, when I hear about these kind of stories that uh, accompanied the work. Maybe I'll be slightly more militant today <laughs> and, and ask, ask Mark the same question and phrase it slightly differently because I don't know what's been flashing behind me. We just get these different kind of levels of light <laughs> appearing behind us. We keep kind of turning around to see those, see those adjustments. Um, so to phrase it quite, because I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with some of your, with some of the projects that you've been involved with, um, even prior to the, to the to the Heathrow project and the and the Mark Wallinger horse piece that I spoke about earlier, is there a danger, um, although there may be a kind of very considered subversiveness, or sub, a, a kind of subversiveness that also demonstrates another a, a, an alternative kind of consideration of of the environment, but is does 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 a work, not perhaps like Alex's, but other works that you've been involved with, is it, I'll put a Marxist hat on now, but are you just promoting a kind of process of gentrification of certain areas? Um, kind of dropping in the idea that this artwork drops into that space, that people will come to visit that space, and then suddenly it's this kind of cultural hotspot, and it, it gives this other identity for, for a town at the expense of... Um, these narratives that we, we spoke about earlier when, when, when Daphne was talking. So are you also responsible for a kind of process of gentrification that's promoted by a small group of people in terms of commissioning the work? Right. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think, I, th I think what we've done is we've found new markets, we've found new patrons. We're kind of almost pulling it back to some extent to how it used to be. I mean, I think the problem with the arts has been you know, gentrification of the art world. You know, it's kind of been packaged up and put into museums and galleries and, and funded in a particular way. I mean, what would be interesting is whether your project motivates a whole series of projects or provokes a whole series of projects as a result of the success where other people are funding them. So are there another three or four of these in Margate or, or Ramsgate or, you know, because of what you did? And the problem we find is that 
you know, we never get to drop things in. I mean, we never get to, we never get a client come to us and say, "Here's you know half a million. Do you want to go and put a piece of art in?" In fact, what you're doing is you're fighting um, that the the developers, the or or the um, railway companies, or whoever it is, you're fighting them. You're saying art is important. You know, you've paid all this money for architecture, for landscape architecture, for your bricks and mortar, for your land, and so on. But art is something that's kind of this thing that comes along at the end. We don't want to do that. What we want is lead artists dropped into the design teams at the beginning. We want the land, the, the uh, artists to work with the landscape architects. We actually want the artists to design things. So what Future City has been doing over the last, uh, probably over the last five years, has been trying to push ever further. You know, it's got a Sisyphus thing, you know, pushing up the hill to the point where Artists are in at the beginning. You know, I, I was an artist a, a long while ago, and you're the last one in the queue. You know, the last one to get the technology, the last one to do anything. We should be at the front of it. So all we've done as an organisation is just kind of taken on uh, developers, taken on... At the moment, our projects range from doing, you know, the eight crossrail stations to uh, a new uh, research centre in Cambridge... Uh, we got asked recently if we want to get involved in a huge waste pipe that's going into London. So what, what's kind of interesting is we've scaled up as an organisation and suddenly we're getting a lot of interest from organisations that want art but need, to, need organisations that can sort of deal with their world as well. And the problem to some extent is the arts have always been separate. So when we do do a project as, as arts people, we do something at the end and the money's separated. What I'm interested in, I want the bridge, I want the trees, I want the bus stops. I, you know, I basically want to go into a, a, a new project and sort of raid it, and then go out and sort of bring artists in. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain, if you, you know, there's some slides there, but if you ask the artists that we work with, do they in any way feel that we're diluting their practice? I think they say no. I think there's a, we saw a building there just now um, where Claire, da uh, Claire Woods worked on the entire skin of the building of the, uh, the, of the architecture. She got the entire building. So you had the bravery of the client to say, we're going to use quite a radical architect, as Ken Shuttleworth at the time. But not only that, we're going to let an artist uh, do something on the skin of that building. you think if it had failed, if they hadn't been able to sell anything, if it had, if it had been a bad reaction. So it's an incredibly brave thing to do. And it wasn't a, a legislative uh, thing they were doing. They did it because we persuaded them to do it. And that, that uh, company has, since then, has, we were just talking to Random International about a major project. They'd be using ever inter more interesting artists on ever more radical interpretations of the landscape and architecture. So I, I, I think there is, there's no doubt, gentrification, we all know that, don't we? You know, the artists move in, then the developers come, the artists move out. That isn't actually the case, I don't think, anymore. I think you're seeing at King's <coughs> Cross as a good example where the arts and culture and creativity is what drives this country. And the, and the clever developers... And the clever private sector organisations are seeing that and trying to get, get hold of it. Now, it's our fault, our problem, if we, can't, if we don't have a vocabulary that enables us to sort of negate, ne negotiate with those people. And in the past, the way we negotiated was through a bit of legislation, like Percent for Arts or 106, with a kind of arbitrary amount of money spent, you know, just to buy a little bit of art that was never enough money. So, you know, I, no, I'm not ashamed of it. I think what we're trying to do at the moment is sort of drive something quite unusual. I just wanted to respond to what uh, Mark's saying there, because I think in spite of the, the, what, I, what I'm interested in doing and, and the work that I do, I am conscious of the impact that um, the art in the public realm or, or public art, whatever you want to call it, has in terms of and, and its contribution to the gentrification of urban environments. And I think it is, you know, that that effect is inevitable. And I and, and I I wouldn't. Um, I think it's dangerous to to um, suggest that that isn't a part of the of that 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 process. That actually, the so-called public environment that we all think of as publicly owned, is is gradually being very much bought up and privatised and owned. I mean, large chunks of London are, are certainly not owned by um, public authorities. And um, private um, organisations, private companies, um, do in fact take the opportunity to work with artists, and and, um, and, and don't necessarily go through a process that means that they're um, they're sensitive to what kind of projects those might be, and and, and actually do Im probably impose artworks in situations where they're not necessarily the best solution or the best outcome because they have that power and they can. So 
I think to, to, to suggest that that isn't happening is, is really... Um, no, but what I'm saying, kind of I, I agree with you, you know, ba there's bad art and poorly judged art and corporate art. There's, there's, always a, there's has a been. hell of a lot of but, horrible public but There's also art. a really a horrible lot of public art that's been paid for by the public sector. So, you know, it's not... The, what I want to try and say is it's not one or the other. It's the public sector has had a... a you know, for the right reasons, uh, a sort of ownership of art from the good times. It's had the money and it's had... In fact, you know, if you look pre-crash... You not only had public sector funding, but you also had a lot of private funding following that. So there was at times relatively good. But of course, all that's falling away. All that kind of uh, backup and money is dropping. And so what I think is happening is we're all sort of huddling further in an ever tighter group. We're going, the money's running out. The Arts Council aren't, haven't got the funding for us anymore. Where do we go? Where do we go? And I think you've got to look at other markets. You've got to look at other opportunities. And that means artists have to perhaps think differently, have to work harder to be involved in... Uh, you know, a, a vocabulary in a world that's perhaps not, not comfortable, because, or, or not, or just make their work. Edward's hands shut yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I'd better get over. <laughs> At the front, 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 sorry, front row. Yeah. Yeah. My, my question to you really is that in this environment where people are sort of hunkering down, surely the, the, the drive is towards making art much more instrumental, so achieving certain commercial purposes or even social purposes and so surely that that works against art that is actually um culturally active um and what we tend to get is more culturally inert art very tame art uh, where are the sort of controversies that we could i mean we should be seeing occasionally controversial public artworks like tilted art that happened in america if we're pushing the boundaries i don't see anything that's actually creating that kind of um, excitement, the, the real, a real dialogue. So that'd be my sort of question. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good question, and one of the questions I would ask Mark as well is uh, encouraging artists to work in that area, and I think that's fine. But I do think it also um, co comes down to the artist producing a commodity, but it's a different form of commodity. It's not commodity for the gallery system; it's a commodity for a different arena, but it's still a commodity. And the artist gets known for that production, and then um, you know, they're, they're used on a different building site and on a different uh, thing, organising. But at the same time, I appreciate that you're in that arena and you're forging a space, and the hope is that it doesn't all turn into a commodification for those artists. But it's a very seductive arena for an artist because it's almost the only arena where you can make a decent living as an artist without selling um, work as a product. So a lot of artists that wouldn't be in the gallery system are in the public art arena because they can make a living. So it is quite a seductive area. And it, it is, you know, if you were successful on one project, you'd be asked onto another and another. So I don't know if it's a positive or a negative thing, but it's worth noting, I suppose. But I, I, you know, the art, the art. I was thinking of the gallery world and the artists that we all know and love. Um, isn't that always been the case? Hasn't it always been that artists follow the follow money, follow patronage, follow? I'm desperate for the first gallery exhibition, hoping that you know the, the galleries will find them and give them some support. Isn't that always been the way? And if that if that hasn't been there. Where have they gone then? Gone to funding organisations like the Arts Council, as I did when I was, was an artist. So, you know, we're very limited in, in choices. I don't think it's commodification because it implies that artists are selling out. I mean, if you look at Claire Woods, you know, she, was, she makes, uh, she's a gallery artist. She, makes, she paints on, on an aluminium, these amazing urban landscapes. And we suddenly gave her an opportunity to make a work in which we, she had the entire facade of a building. Um, she didn't then do lots of facades of buildings, as, as far as I'm aware. That was it. And similarly, Paul Morrison, whose work is up behind us, simply had a similar situation where we had a, an amazing opportunity where we got an artist to uh, go into a place they would never normally go. And having gone in there and come out, you hope it enriches their own profession. But they're not going to be offered another five buildings or another ten bridges. Or I, I mean, I'd be great if they were to some, to some extent. They've always been dealing in a way with a kind of cultural capital. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. how does one play that off? Good, Anna, you get to add something else. Well, yes, uh, I, I suppose uh, one, one would have to sort of discern certain things here. Um, if, if we go back again, 
I think the question was very good, actually, and it raises quite an important uh, thing about the commodification of art and the commodification of public art, and whether that happens or not. And that leads us to the point that was raised at the very beginning, what is public art as opposed to, public, to the art that is not public. And in, 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 of course you were right to say all art, in order to have a status of a work of art, has to be public in a wider sense. All art has to have that recognition to be the work of art, even if it's kept in a private room. It has to have this kind of, if you want, um, recognition on behalf of societies, experts, makers, audience, whatever, to be a claim, uh, to, to claim the status to be a work of art, and then it could be kept in, in private. We all know that. So in a way, all art has to be, in a way, public. But what we are talking about here, when we talk about public art, we are talking about different notion of public art. We are talking about art in public spaces. I suppose that's the theme. Yeah. So that, that's kind of different. Okay, because all art is public, but there is art in public spaces. And that, I think, criteria is slightly different. And uh, I think you're quite right to sort of argue about this point, you know, whether it gets commodified or not, or whether it's good or not, and of course artists have to survive and so on and so forth. And in a way, there shouldn't be a problem in principle that there is even some overlap between the gallery space and, if you want, the... Um, the public space, which is perhaps uh, commissioned by public money, uh, as long as perhaps that work still remains uh, and still claims and, and manages to, to sort of retain, as it were, the status of the work of art in the eyes of the public. That is to say, the quality of the work has to be there to justify, uh, as it were, the status of the public. But do you mean the public or do you mean critical? You sound, well, you sound to me like you're both. talking about it's, a critical response rather than a public response. I think both, both the public and the critics have to sort of get engaged with a particular work of art, whether that will be a dialogue, even sometimes could be quite provocative. It doesn't matter, but it's still a, a dialogue. And, uh, you know, and sometimes, as, as Cornelia was saying at the beginning, you know, uh, it does not happen... Um, it, it takes some time for art to sort of get, gain that status, and sometimes uh, it's met with suspicion, and sometimes it has to go certain ways to get uh, a claim, uh, to get recognition, and so on and so forth. But it still provokes the dialogue, and you know, critics pay, play their part, curators play their part, uh, participants, local participants, local people who work or live there play their part. So in a way. Uh, that is somehow filtered, that status, to become a public art. It's not something that can be just done on the basis of being commissioned. That's my point, I suppose. You can be commissioned, but, you know, something can be a commissioned work of art and then be a flop and, some, and you know, will disappear. We know this kind of works of art will disappear sooner or later. Or uh, something can be kind of put forward by... Um, by, uh, something can emerge, as we know, as graffiti, i.e. not supported by anybody, and sort of gain the status of public art. Yes? So uh, we have different scenarios. Mm. And the same goes for private money. It could be sometimes that private sponsors are going to put something in a public domain which would be accepted as public art, and sometimes it could be just sort of their frivolous kind of expression that will never kind of get recognition as public art. So in a way, one, one could have these different conditions. Tamsin, were you going to add something quickly? Well, and I, was just gonna, um, I was just thinking, you know, I think a lot of pub, um, work that gets commissioned as public art is unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that necessarily needs, you know, what, what the, we haven't really talked about the criteria that we're, that we're commissioning it from or, or, or valuing it from or measuring it with. And and I and I was just really kind of um, wondering if that that so-called dialogue really is powerful enough or strong enough in in a lot of cases. And and I think that's what your yeah. question was about: whether actually um, how, how often that that dialogue is really there. And it doesn't always have to be provocative. I'm not sure um, if if tilted arc. I mean, that's the that is the the great. Um, um, success or failure, how you, however you want to look at it, that's often cited. 
Um, I th I'm sure if it was put in place now, people probably wouldn't bat an eyelid. I'm not sure it would create the same kind of um, controversy. And, uh, and I'm wondering if the uh, provocative works are, can be works can be provocative in, in a in a subtle, um, much more subtle way. They can they can still create that kind of dialogue. Um, and I think it comes down to frequently how well the artist has really engaged with the with the context that they are um, they're, that they're working with. It's yeah. interesting. It opens up yeah. that idea of a of a contemporary context as much as mm. a um, thing. And it, we probably want to add to things, but there were a couple of people. Catherine, do you still want to ask your question? question as um, I wanted to kind of come back to a few things that were said uh, Mark you were talking about uh, public art being meaning publicly funded and I think um, it would be interesting to kind of talk to Alex about his experience there because it's such a different model and he's really been embraced by British industry lots of companies that he works with who have effectively made the projects that we worked on we kind of co-produced the um, from the knees of my notes in Margate together so uh, they made it possible. And we had a really interesting presentation here, actually, from the British Brick Development Association, where the uh, chief executive of that organisation was talking really passionately about the role of artists in supporting uh, industry innovation. So that was... Um, I mean, I know that kind of goes back to what you're saying about commodification, and does that mean that you're going to get kind of tame work? But I think what they were in, interested in is a lot of the um, uh, preparatory work that Alex had done that led up to that artwork. And actually, that's what they had really invested in and got behind. And then this was, you know, a, a, it was a, a, an added benefit, something to celebrate at the end of that process. Um, but I think that there is a, a different model, which is, you know, Great. quite interesting. No, and you had a question. Um, this is going in a slightly different direction, but I guess I, I was in Paris at the weekend and I noticed while I was there that they seem to manage to make spaces where art can happen in a way that somehow I don't, I mean, maybe, I, I, maybe it happens in spaces in, in England that I don't know about, but like spaces where people just come and do things that are artistic, kind of of their own volition. So, for instance, Republique Square, the Place de la République has been recently redeveloped in such a way that it's much easier to walk around. And it's a, just a big empty space. And it's very much a cultural thing. But, you know, the space permits and invites and allows people to just do artistic things. So on Saturday evening, there was um, the remnants of a parade that had turned into a dance party on one end. And then there was, like, a DJ with, like, a kind of tarpaulin behind him and some people kind of doing dubstep on the other end. And... And, and then I went to another space that had a similar thing. People were just, like, rehearsing their theater productions in, in this public space. And I just wonder a little bit about, you know, whether we should think also about spaces that invite creative responses from the public. You know, whether it has to be an artwork in and of itself or whether actually it's a space that invites people. We're we talked about dialogue and, and maybe, you know, that that's the same thing in a way and an artwork can do that. But I wonder also whether something about the quality of space can invite people to do things in it that would, that would also have a similar effect, I suppose, to an artwork. You know? I, would say, I would say Tamsin would be the, should answer that. I mean, what, <laughs> I mean yet that's, that's the beauty of what you, know, what, what you do, isn't it? That you provoke reactions in the most bizarre and strange places at all, all times, day and night. It's, it, it, yeah, I, I mean... Um... I think a lot of people think of London Underground as one of the last real democratic space, public spaces because it is actually still publicly owned. How much longer, I, who knows? <laughs> um, and it certainly is a, a place where every, you're, you're likely to cross paths there um, with a, a huge, wide range of people, rich, poor, and internationally based or, you know, um, from every country in the world. So it, is, it has that incredible um, sort of mixture of uh, range of, of people that, that, that pass through it. And, of course, whether it's in response to the, to the, you know, I think in terms of the resources that we put into the Art and the Underground program, it has a very tiny 
impact on the network as a whole, but, but it has incredible spaces and places where people um, spontaneously do, do odd things, burst out into song on a train or, you know, it does. It, I think people feel that kind of um, sense of being able to do that on the tube at the same time as um, taking great pains to pretend they're actually travelling completely on their own and ignoring their fellow passengers, which I think which is um, what the majority of people might do, certainly during the week. So it, feel, you know, it does feel like a space like that. But I was thinking about, you know, you might be talking about places like Trafalgar Square or the new... King's Cross area, but I'm still concerned about this notion of, um, of, of of giving of whether those spaces are really public, whether they're kind of offered in this kind of. Um, but that's not the fault. That's the thing. That's not the fault of of, of curators or artists. That's the fault of of master planners and architects well, that's, and landscape that's what I'm, that's what so my concern So maybe we should ask was. the architect. Yeah. Well, can, I, can I just say, this is a deeply political question, actually. Yes, exactly. And that comes to the, if you want, uh, to the major, major difference between this country and France, if you want. And this is to say, this being a monarchy and France being a republic. And this is really, it might be strange for people who... who are used to live in this country, but if you are really a French architect, and that happens to us a lot when we are working with French colleagues, and when they come to this country, they're always amazed by this fact that we have all these leaseholds, freeholds, ownership of lands, Duke of, uh, what is it, Westminster still owning half of London, and these things. They just can't comprehend it. You know, parks are owned by the royal family, things like that. So in a way, when you start actually explaining this to people, then you realize that actually the space, the public space in this country is privately owned. And it's absolutely right what Tasman was saying, that you have to go into the underground, <laughs> into underground, literary public underground, to actually feel the publicness of that space. Because that's the space which is still, as you say, public. Hmm. I still so think you're it. absolutely right. It's a public space. So outside, it is not. The example I like to say, and which I think is quite good to illustrate that point, we don't have these kind of spaces like Place Little Bleak in London. Uh, the other place that is also uh, similar in, in France, in, um, in Paris, would be Parc La Villette, the La Villette, which was designed by Bernard Chumi, where you can actually go and use that park as you wish. Uh, and you don't have to sort of prenotate or do anything. You can just use it. And you have several places like that. We don't have it in London. And one of these kind of political things that in that sense appear quite often uh, is best illustrated by, if I may bring that example of the fourth column in the Trafalgar Square, where we had that plinth, which is sort of from time to time occupied by a different artist. And then, which I think is great, whoever came up with that idea is great. But what is also great is, you know, what kind of debate that generated. And I was just listening to the news, being just a passive speaker of the news, when there was just one of these kind of changes of, you know, what will be, what will be replacing the previous sculpture after uh, the lady uh, who was there uh, for a while is, is to be changed. And then they were just reporting what is going to change it and how another piece of work will come and so on and so forth. So that was one piece of news in the kind of culture bulletin of the news. And then in the, perhaps it could have been a couple of days later, in, the, in another piece of uh, news uh, would be something, and the, the, the monument uh, to the Queen Mother has been decided to be placed at the mall, full stop. Who decided? Who debated? No one knows it. It seems that somebody in the establishment, it was not even the parliament. I think it was just the, the, the kind of something that came straight from the kind of PR of, of, of the Buckingham Palace or something like that. That was decided by the royal house of, I don't know, family. And it was kind of without any explanation. And then I just thought about it, how strange. All that debate was about that kind of column and who will replace it? And the whole nation was involved, curators, artists, public, media, competition, and all that, just for that one place, which is temporarily anyway. And this 
um, monument to the Queen Mother. Sorry, I don't have anything against the Queen Mother or the royal family. It's not a kind really? of a monarch. No, it's not. A, I'm not making an anti monarchist point. I'm just sort of showing how the ownership works. They, that kind of uh, monument to the Queen Mother could be put by a decision of whoever from the royal palace at any time, and nobody will contest it. And that's kind of just kind of strange that we live in this kind of country with this kind of attitude towards space and with this kind of ownership towards space. And then, of course, you have the, as I understand it, the Chinese model, where there, there isn't a sense of public space at all. It just doesn't, it's just not a concept um, for them at all. Um, you were itching to say something. I don't know if you've calmed down. No, <laughs> I had a sense you were about to leap across the table. But. Well, it's, I, I just... I, I just I don't sort of I don't understand what you're saying, if I'm honest. I don't understand yeah, what you're I getting at. I, I think it's you know, we've got a we've got a planning process in London and, and all the cities. You can't just put anything up when you feel like it. You have to go through it. and even an artwork has to go through planning. Um, that most of London is public realm. I mean that the the I know there's that uh, grounds was it ground zero, the, the book about you know, the kind of policing, the, the kind of canary wharf type thing where you've got private uh, police forces and so on. But on the whole, my experience is that, and King's Cross is a good example of that, and I think White City and, and, um, and Stratford, is that there is a real sense now that creativity and culture is a really good thing, and in fact, if you're intelligent, you open up everything, you create parks and public spaces, and you, be, you, in, you involve creative organisations and people in your thinking and your design processes. And part of the problem is that that isn't happening enough, that there is a kind of structure we have in this country of you know, the, the master plan that shapes everything out, architects get to do all the, all the kind of hard things, the soft stuff's done by the landscape architects, art is coming at the end. You said earlier, yes, we put a cross on the spots where the art goes, and that, I've just seen that so many times, and I think this is what we're fighting, is let's not put X's on the spot, let's get the artist in at the beginning and make public art part of the whole process, so that it's, it's almost like a discipline in its own right, like an architect or a landscape architect is. That's, that would be my... Um, you know, I think that's where we're trying to push. I think those, those projects are interesting. There's, there seems to be this distinction between placemaking, where there's a kind of new place being yeah. made, and then replacing or replacemaking yes. um, in those sorts of contexts. Did, I'll come to Sophia. We've got about five minutes left, so we haven't got a lot of time. And let's jump in and say Very quickly, and then one last question, because the hand keeps going up. But very quickly. <laughs> well, I guess... In, in this respect, in, uh, I'm probably um, the most surprising person to say this, but I think the responsibility, a, a large responsibility, has to be on the artists and the people who want to create these things. You know, there's so many art schools and there's so many artists. It's a tough world and a com competitive environment. And it's so easy to say, oh, there's no spaces, there's no money, there's no way, you know, I would do this, but... and. You, you know, you don't realise your ambitions with buts, you know. You realise your ambitions with kind of hard work and um, struggle and an element of, I, I guess, I, a little bit of kind of shamelessness. You know, you've got, you've got to fight for it. And so I think a large responsibility is with the artist to find a way, you know, navigate a path through which their career can evolve and along the way realise the things that they want to realise. Um, because you, like, like Mark was saying, the money dries up and the opportunities are very finite. So you've just got to find your own. And that's a huge part of contemporary art making. Um, out, I'd say outside of the gallery walls, but within the gallery walls has its own kind of struggles and responsibilities and battles. Um, but I, I guess in that respect, from an artist, I would say that the responsibility and the fight has to come from the artists as well. It can't be on a plate. And one final question. I was going to have to be a good one. Um, my <laughs> question really uh, is about the fact that lots of this discussion has been about permanent work. And what for me was one of the most exciting and interesting kind of aspects of the crash, you know, and, uh, and the last few years and the, and the drying up of the money, be it public uh, subsidy or private sector and the developers has been the exciting and innovative work that artists have made that was temporary in the public realm, that was ephemeral, which was time-limited, and not just limited to festivals and biennials in the public realm, but also just in some of those in-between spaces that hadn't yet 
been developed, they weren't yet there. And some of that is was instrumental, and it was placemaking by any other name. It was bringing artists into places to help to do that work with communities to understand how they might uh, accept development is the hard hard end of it. But the other, the other, I think, more interesting is is how they might have actually helped to shape what was going to happen in those places and, and, and begin to give a sense of the voice of the people who live in a place through those sorts of work. So it seems to me, you know, we've kind of missed a whole... I don't know, we've been still just de- defining what public art is, but a whole section of what I think is some of the most exciting art in the public realm, really. A good example of that then would be New York, couldn't it, with Creative Time and Public Art Fund, where you know, they, the money is generated mostly through foundations and private sector funding, and that then allows works to be made uh, and, and located variously around, around New York, but it never stays. It's there temporarily and it moves on. And, and in fact, we recently did a piece of work with the City of London uh, where we put a strategy together which, which was based on the creative time model, and that's led to the, uh, to a sculpt, um, the sculpture uh, project that's there. It's been in its third year now. So, no, I agree. I, I, but again, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Where does the funding come from, and where does the space come from for, those, for the kind of New York, if you like, the New York model to take place? Because that's an interesting one, I think. Can I, add, can I just say, I didn't, I didn't necessarily have the impression we were only talking about permanent public art, art at all. In fact, I mean, most of the... I think there's a huge um, value in ephemeral projects, temporary projects, and different kinds of interventions, whether they're even a physical manifestation or something, uh, uh, something that's, that you hear, or a, and just an event, a performance work. And, um, uh, and most of the projects that Art in the Underground creates are, in fact, temporary projects in lots of different um, strands. But... Importantly, um, a number of them are permanent. I mean, the, the work that I think there have been some images, um, the latest, you know, network-wide work, which I think is quite a groundbreaking work for the programme by uh, Mark Wallinger, the Labyrinth Project, is a permanent work, but at the same time it's very subtle and it's based on... Um, it, it takes so many different references into the, into the development of the work and yet it, um, it will be there as long as London Underground is there and we'll, we'll start to f- filter into the folklore around London Underground. So it almost operates like an ephemeral work at the same time. I meant was the conversation we're having about who owns what space and, and yeah. those, sort of, those big commissions. But I think it's equally... I think those points are valid for the idea of temporary and, and ephemeral works in the same way. I've grabbed the mic because I want to ask Daphne something. Sorry. Um, (laughs) I mean, talking about this, I think your project, which is sort of flashed up here, but doesn't do itself justice just with images, the Homebodies Project, is really interesting in this respect. (laughs) You gave me the images, so you should know what they look like. (laughs) Anyway, I just think... Could you just describe it? Because I think it's a really interesting approach to thinking about the opportunity to work... You know, it was under the auspices of a public art project, but it was not traditional. And I just think it's interesting how, you know, we've... I guess part of it, we've talked about public-private in terms of ownership, but actually in terms of activity... Yeah. Sorry okay. to put you on the spot. Yeah, just, uh, I guess, really quickly. Um, well, the project, it's called Home Ornaments, and it's a group of five idiosyncratic little objects. And it was for um, the Gorbals up in Glasgow, which had been... The project had been underway for, I would say, about ten years, and when I came in, it was near the tail end of it. So a lot of the development and the developers were satisfied and contented that they had bigger sculptural permanent pieces and um, I think by the time I came along nobody was interested which was a a really good position to be in so I was just allowed to get on with it and um, there was 127 apartments being built by Pierce Goff's um, architectural company and my brief was to respond to that and it was a different the Gorbals had been uh, for about the last 150 years be re- um, vitalized. This was the third time it was being revitalized, and so the population that was going to take over this these homes were not just Gorbal people, but um, what the Gorbals people called yuppies. So it was mixed housing. So some were for um, pe- people who had already been moved out of the the flats that were there, and also 
people coming in from elsewhere. And how I responded to it was I began to go around and interview people, mainly because the, the Artworks programme had a tent, a gazebo, down outside Quicksave on the streets of the Gorbals with images of all their previous sculptures and commissions up and they asked the public for response and it was just like being in the lion's den <laughs> and uh, in the end I said well it was so vicious I said well what would you like and a lot of people said things like um, heroes um, from, the, from the, uh, the war and heroes from the industrial past of Glasgow and very very conventional notions of sculpture which I found really fascinating and really I could have made if if I wanted to at that time and I was tempted and in a way home ornament uh, the, the pieces refer to that kind of want um, so I made something like five different pieces and had them made by craftspeople from various places and I interviewed loads and loads of people and got loads and loads of the social background to Glasgow. But in some way they are within the pieces of work, but in other ways they're not. I forgot the narrative behind each piece by the time I came round to it. But what we did was then we placed each one of these ornaments into the apartment on a shelf that Pierce's architects designed and then everybody was given a manual to how to look after their objects and they were told who else, what other objects were in the series and that they could swap their object with their neighbours. I, I, I suppose I was playing with the notion of them building up a new community through a series of swap cards. And um, also, what else did we do? We, we had a lot of... Um, follow on the, the people who when they sold their house or when they bought their houses they were given um, the stories behind each piece the narrative that accompanied the object and a lot of people were very suspect about them and some people um, some people threw them out some people kept them and some people tried to collect the lot of them so it was very different uh, uh, reactions to them but it, for me, it wasn't so much the object at all. It was much more about the debate it caused between this, this group of 127 people. And also, the, we asked them that the piece would be kept with the flat, that it didn't go to the ownership of the person. It stayed with the flat. But we couldn't enforce that, so it was suggested. And I suppose I was really interested in the idea of ownership, if this was a public art piece then actually only a small minority of the Gorbos people actually got these pieces, but the new incomers got them. And then in the end, we gifted a set to, the, to Goma, the Glasgow Museum. And once they went in there, we invited the people from the flats to come. And immediately the value that people attached to their object increased. And we had... Uh, phone calls saying, I rented my apartment straight away, I didn't even go into it, and now the object's missing, what can we do? It's really, <laughs> really um, um, interesting, but the objects themselves are quite awkward and embarrassing, but they are ornaments, and in some way I was looking at the whole thing about ornamentation and decoration and craft, how that is considered low art, and there was a lot of different um, narratives attached to it, which going to be too boring for everybody to hear. Well, I love this idea of public art as a kind of black market currency. Yeah. Mm. That's, a, that's mm. maybe a, a, something to think about. Okay, we've run out of time, unfortunately, um, but I'd like to kind of end by thanking everybody for joining us today, but particularly to, to thank um, the members of our panel um, who have opened up some really interesting um, issues around um, the notion of um, public art. It always feels like we don't have enough time to, to consider everything. And, and, and in all the conversations, there's always, oh, but we haven't talked about this and we haven't talked about that. Um, maybe that's for next time. Um, so once again, thank you all. Thank you to the panel. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at the, uh, the next big debate here at Turner. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe that's <laughs> it's ideas on the post-it note to Lauren. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah.